Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, I hope so. Good morning. We're about to begin. Uh, I want to introduce myself. I'm David Barboza. I'm a former New York Times reporter and now the co-founder of The Wire, a news and data startup. And we have a session today on Chinese threats to the US supply chain, which probably couldn't be more timely than right now. But I'm going to begin with a few uh, announcements. First, we'd like to thank today's breakout session room sponsor, Palo Alto Networks. Also, questions from the audience. So after uh, we begin, we'll start taking questions. If you come up with a question, please fill out the forms and send them to the aisles, and someone at the aisles will pick them up and bring them up to me. Uh, thirdly, uh, unfortunately, this session is not eligible for continuing education credits. Sorry for that. Um, and finally, the media may be present during this breakout session. Doesn't say that's a warning, but I think it is. It's hard to hear. I can't so I want to I want to jump in and really give the time to this uh, distinguished panel, but I want to start with a little context for everyone, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows where we are today um, when you think about just the title, Chinese Threats to U.S. Supply Chains. The context is this. Um, as we all know, global supply chains are being reimagined and restructured, uh, partly because of COVID, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also growing hostilities between the U.S. and China over the future of Taiwan. We all probably know that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are meeting this week or today um, in Uzbekistan. And so we also know there is a great competition going on between the US and China over resources and technology. And because of that, the US and China are both reconsidering threats to their own supply chains. This session, of course, is going to deal with the threat to the U.S. supply chain. I want to leave you before we turn to our panel with one thought, which is um, most of America's advanced computer chips are made in Taiwan, 100 miles from mainland China. So that alone will give you the sense of where we are today and why this is such a critical question. Um, so the, the real questions are, what do we do about that? And uh, we have a distinguished panel here today. Uh, Jeanette McMillan is here. Jeanette is the Assistant Director for the Supply Chain and Cyber Directorate, the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, part of ODNI. Uh, Halima Najib Locke is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense in charge of industrial uh, base resilience. We also have retired Lieutenant General Thomas Horland, who served 39 years in the U.S. Army. Today he is with the Defense and National Security Arm of the Intel Corporation. And finally, Peter Schwartz, co-founder and chief science officer of Altana, a company engaged in mapping global supply chains. So let me begin with really the the problem or the challenges faced by the U.S., uh, by China. So I'd like to really get the panel to really define this problem a little more than I've done at the beginning of this session. Uh, there, we know there have been a flurry of supply chain reports coming out of the U.S. government over the last two years questioning the critical areas of that supply chain, how do you protect it, and whether we actually know who is involved in the supply chain. So I ask the panel, we're going to start with Jeanette McMillan, um, the question of what is the issue? What is the problem with America's supply chain? And what is the threat posed by China? I wonder if, if Jeanette can begin, and then I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Uh, 
Verlander. Thank you so much, David. Um, no pressure there. How long do we have again in terms of uh, <laughs> trying to explain this? So um, thank you all so much. Uh, first of all, it's great to have an entire audience and some standing room in the back um, because normally when I talk about supply chains, it is almost crickets. And um, it is also uh, usually right after lunch hour. So um, it's, it's very good to see that uh, supply chains have certainly become a household name, and more importantly, um, our foreign adversaries have been absolutely paying attention to this new and emerging threat vector. Um, we've all had a wonderful opportunity during the pandemic to sit at home and watch, you know, all of the things that we're looking at, everything from semiconductors to software, malware to meat packing, peanut butter to pipelines, uh, firmware to formula. All of these particular threats are threatening our supply chains. Just uh, this morning, we avoided a supply chain uh, a, a threat to our railway system. Um, just last week, the, a the, AF the F-35 uh, received some additional bad news from Lockheed Martin in terms of the supply chain and materials coming into it from um, China. So this is a large and emerging threat vector, and again, our adversaries know it. Um, the global nature of these supply chains and the expansive nature is just so vast. And one of the things that we've been taking track of, especially at um, NCSC, is how there are critical supply chains that we know uh, impact our military, impact our infrastructure, impact this our everyday way of life. Um, so I don't know if you all recall, there was a wonderful um, executive order that was placed out um, called America's Supply Chains, where we had at least six critical sectors with one-year reviews on them. And this past year, those uh, particular reports were pushed out. And each and every one of those critical sectors, transportation, food, health care, uh, did, um, to, to, to say another one, as well as our energy sector, and all of those things had threats against them. But the number one threat that they all came in common was a threat from the cyber supply chain. And as we well know, our foreign adversaries understand that all too well, China in particular. And whether it is a software supply chain coming through the actual software, through a, a Microsoft update, or through, and, and again, just any software out there, or whether it is indeed a Log4j exploit that's being used by um, foreign military, foreign adversaries, foreign intelligence services, these are the threat vectors that, are, that we understand that our, that our foreign adversaries are trying to get after. Cyber is one of the most prolific things. Everybody understood that they were a cyber company when JDS Meat Company got hacked, when pipelines were getting hacked, when school districts are getting hacked. That cyber supply chain is the one that we need to fortify the most because we know that each and every other supply chain is fully dependent upon it. And that's exactly where our, our threats are, being com are coming from. Not to say it's the only one. I know we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, that is the one that is most prolific, and that's exactly where our enemies are headed. General Horlander. Uh, yeah, thank you. So hello to everybody, uh, and especially to my panelists, my fellow panelists here. Great to meet you guys. Um, <clears throat> so Thomas Horlander here. Um, you guys, I am a digital immigrant, okay? Many of you that are of my, of my age will probably identify with that, okay? But if you recognize me, it's because you went out on the Webster Dictionary, you opened it up where it said digital immigrant, and there's a big picture of me. I'm an end user, okay? Raise your hand if you remember when you got your first computer. I got the 286, okay, back in the mid-90s. That thing weighed 50 pounds, and the monitor probably weighed 50 pounds, and it was deeper than it was wide. And we brought it home, and we tried to set it up, and we set it up on the kitchen table. And we thought, oh my goodness, where are we going to put this thing? And then Moore's Law kicked in, and then the, th the 386 came out, and the 486, and then you had this Pentium chip, and here we are today, not asking the question of where do we put this thing, but, oh my gosh, where did I put this thing, right? So, um, I, I kind of share that with you, you guys, because um, when I tell you, when I look at this problem, when, and, and I, I spent 39 years in the United States Army, what a great, great privilege to be able to do that, I will just tell you. Thank you for your service. So, <laughs> okay. But, but let me turn the tables. Thank you for your service, you guys, because 
you are just as important to, to addressing this threat as somebody who is serving in, in uniform right now, okay? Every single person in this room. So, but here, here's what I would tell you as I joined Intel, what a great privilege to be on the Intel team. And I joined them about six months ago. So all my life I was this end user, and then I get this opportunity to try to learn about microelectronics, okay? And I tell you, it's been an uphill learning curve for me. But here's what I would tell you. To have a good, educated conversation about this topic, you need to understand something. You need to understand that this gets done in a series of phases, okay? We go out there, we design software, we design hardware. That's the first step, is the design phase. Then you go into the manufacturing phase, where you're going to actually take some raw materials, some rare earth elements, and turn those into a microchip. And I can include in that phase the equipment that it takes to do that, okay? And then we go into this assembly, testing, and packaging where now you've got these microchips and you got to make them do something, right? So you put them on motherboards, you couple them with fans, resistors, transistors, and before you know it, you've got this, you got this series of electronics that finally becomes an end product after we go through and we test it, okay? Now in its most simplest form, that is the microelectronics continuum that I like to talk about. But what I just described to you is incredible is incredibly, incredibly complex. And there is not a single actor in that ecosystem that does it all from cradle to grave. Not a single, not a single company, not, not a, nobody does that from cradle to grave. Therein lies an inherent risk in our supply chain. Because this is a supply chain that is global, okay? And a microchip can change hands 10 and 20 times before it actually gets into an end product that goes to market, okay? Understanding that is really fundamental to, try, to, to tackling this problem, okay? And I, I have just been amazed at what I've learned about this ecosystem because it is, this industry is so integrated. And one day, your competitor, the next day is your partner, okay? and everybody is very much integrated. I tell you, that's how this industry has to be to be able to function, okay? But just have an appreciation for that as to, and put a little context around this as we try to sit here and tackle these big problems, one of those being securing the, the supply chain uh, of, our, of our microelectronics. Secretary Najib Long. Thank you, David, and yes, thank you to the panelists, thank you to all the attendees. Um, this is, I think, quite honestly, uh, a reckoning that we have known for a long time when it comes to our vulnerabilities in the supply chain, and as far as the, the government is concerned, I mean, everything that my fellow panelists said, we've been studying, you all have been studying for years. I mean, from the Department of Defense, we've continuously issued the Industrial Capabilities Report, which has highlighted areas of concern in our DIB, areas of concern in our supply chain, and potential strategies that we can employ to perhaps narrow some of the gaps. But the reality is we can't get rid of all risk, and so we have to now prioritize. And as my fellow panelists said, when the administration issued all of the reports in response to Executive Order 14017, America Supply Chain, we also, in the President's budget, resourced areas that we have now prioritized that we want to get after, microelectronics being one of them, energy storage and batteries being another, kinetic capabilities. I mean, the invasion of Ukraine is uh, another highlight outside of what happened with the pandemic of how interconnected our supply chains are. And, and the reality is this is really critical right now because our adversaries have stated in their public documents that they're going to take advantage of their points of leverage to impact and inflict pain. And so we now have a different type of negotiation where the economic levers that you all experience every day, I mean, 
Where was the toilet tissue, right? Where was all the, the brass tax goods that we're used to having? That was a stoppage. And so we now know if you take that and apply it to the defense sector, you are in a circumstance where those components and parts are not accessible, which means our manufacturing capacity is really choked up. So given how complex all of our systems are, particularly with you know, all of the technology that is being uh, created because of innovators like you, we need source material, we need critical materials, we need parts, components, castings, and forgings, but we don't have the capability to really vertically integrate and so now we're trying to employ tactics of friendshoring and the like, things where we can really think through who are our allies and where do we have dominance and they have dominance and we can figure out how to interconnect this because frankly, we are better served when not one country has the capability to completely dominate or influence the supply chain for any area. And so that's why the interconnectedness is a focus for supply chains, because we have, I think, with globalization, taken our finger off the pulse on exactly where things are sourced and built. And now with both the president's EOs as well as Congress actions and passing key legislation and resourcing it, we're in a position to now really re-onshore and expand domestic capacity where we're needed. Right, thank you. It seems uh, one of the big questions underlying all those answers is, um, is there the possibility that China is entering those supply chains, disrupting those supply chains, blocking some of, of the U.S. from getting certain resources or technology? And I want to turn the second question to General Commander, who worked in the U.S. Army and now is at Intel. Because the other day when we, we chatted on the phone, he said to me, we're in a race against time. And I wonder, General Horlander, whether you could talk a little about what, what did you mean by we're in a race against time? So, so what I meant by that was if you look across, if you look across the ecosystem, and I think you re referred to TSMC, you guys, the Taiwanese uh, semiconductor manufacturing company over there in Taiwan that uh, produces over 70% of the high-end chips for the globe, okay? So right now we have this imbalance, this global imbalance of capacity where 85% of the microchips come out of three countries in Southeast Asia, China, South Korea, and Taiwan, okay? That was not, that was not how it was 25 years ago, but that is the sight picture that we're dealing with today. And so how do we redomesticate? How do we onshore that capacity so that there is this better balance that you were talking about, right? And, and how do we do that? So one great first step was the CHIPS Act, okay? Now what does the CHIPS Act do? The CHIPS Act allows us to expand the fabrication, the manufacturing capacity in this country so that it is not so uh, out of balance and when we have this over dependency on what on what comes out of Southeast Asia. So when I say we're in a, in a race against time, um, th this isn't something we want to fix in 10 years, okay? We need to get that capacity rebalanced as soon as we can. That was what the CHIPS Act was all about, was to infuse some capital into this industry so that we could build that, build the, uh, the, the, the fabs, we could build the fabs at, at, at an accelerated pace. And I would tell you, what's really, what's really kind of um, refreshing about this is how everybody is really starting to embrace this problem. You guys, I can tell you, I've been to any number of defense summits and forums over the years. We weren't talking about microelectronics five years ago, okay? We've got a lot of the big actors in this ecosystem really looking at their business model. We've got six companies right now that are looking at building fabs over the next decade in the continental United States and Europe, okay? To the tune of a, probably a, a healthy $200 billion investment. So, but, but we have got to move out smartly. Time is of the essence. Uh, 
My next question is whether there actually is evidence that China is taking advantage of these vulnerabilities in the U.S. supply chain. I wonder if you could take that, Jeanette McMillan. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, the, there is no doubt that the supply chains are certainly being um, exploited by um, our, our CCP adversaries. In fact, we can just look at the uptick in uh, the FBI's uh, counterintelligence investigations. Um, I believe it was Director Ray just a few months ago had um, uh, reiterated that every 10 hours, every 10 hours, they are, they are opening up a CI investigation related to a Chinese threat. So again, they are, there's, there's absolutely um, evidence there. Also with regards to some of the indictments that have happened, take a look at the, GO, the GE aerospace uh, case that just uh, was indicted and had um, the charges there. And not only that, it was not only the, the actual infiltration of, um, a, I believe it was a, some sort of malware that was beaconing back to the MSS in China information and intellectual property from GE. It was also the corruption of insiders that were in the company, people that were just looked up on LinkedIn. So I would be remiss if I wouldn't uh, mention that we are indeed looking at um, Insider Threat Month awareness as well mm -hmm. in September. Right. Um, so again, I uh, just wanted to throw that out there as a big plug, but sometimes when we have that, that those two combinations of a cyber threat with an insider, that's where our, our industrial partners are really, really um, at, at risk. So making sure that those are partners, but yes, absolutely, there, there is no doubt that there is indeed targeting by the CCP. Okay. Secretary Najib Block, do you want to add anything to that? Absolutely. So what you have highlighted already, um, Jeanette, is seen also in our CFIUS process. So our foreign investment screening regime, known as the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., has been updated by FIRMA which is a, um, an act of Congress from 2018. And what that did was really strengthen the national security vector on foreign investment. And what we've seen from that is a, a tripling, quadrupling of cases that the committee has now have to oversee and employ mitigation. And quite frankly, what we've also identified through that screening process is the investment flow from, and it's not just from our app series, we screen investment from every foreign entity fairly, looking across with standards. The committee is extremely deliberative in exactly what is the case before us, what are the um, risks posed to the government, and specifically to our national security of these United States, and how can we mitigate that if possible to allow the business to either accept that investment and or if we are going to recommend a, a block or a prohibition of that investment. Oftentimes we mitigate with a, a national security agreement that allows for certain firewalls to be put in place between the investor and the company that they're gaining. And so what we're seeing, frankly, is the CCP and those entities, be it a joint venture or a, a, a fund, or a company in and of itself that is state-owned are very clear in how they're mapping their investment in U.S. technology companies to the stated goals that are related to China 2025 and the like. And, and what we're seeing is also that sometimes companies, you know, they're not particularly witting of the, the ways in which those investors could obfuscate beneficial ownership what they could do to really um, block off exactly who would be the controlling party if you accept that. And so we've seen an uptick of these cases and we've had to mitigate even more because there is absolutely adversarial capital entering these United States and the CCP is oftentimes one of the number one investors that we're really trying to mitigate against.
And, and David, if I could just follow up with that, sure. it is absolutely critical, the, the legislation that was passed in FIRMA. But as we look at it typically with regards to across the security um, spectrum, we've seen our strengthening in our classic physical security, guards, gates, and guns, right? Made sure that those things were protected. You don't necessarily put your guards, gates, and guns around your junk, you put it around your jewels. You look in terms of the investment things that we've strengthened as well in terms of the FIRMA. So where else would our adversaries go but to supply chains in order to make sure that they can regain the, the gains that they lost because of the other fortification. And just one last real quick plug, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get you all to my website, but seriously, <laughs> this, this particular aspect in terms of China's strategic goals, we put this out in 2018 mm -hmm. in the Foreign Economic Espionage Report 2018. Everything in this particular circle is still at play with regards to how the CCP's strategic goals are trying to be executed against the United States. That's and if great, I could just add one more sure. thing, because sure. on that, that absolutely I used to be on the Hill informed a lot of thinking from the government. And so you'll see today President Biden is actually going to announce and sign an executive order strengthening our foreign investment screening to sharpen our national security considerations as a part of CFIUS pulling from the intelligence community, pulling from the counterintelligence community that is highlighting where we are being targeted. And so I think, you know, the government has a, a, a whole of government approach. We're really working with one voice here. So this is critical <clears throat> that we protect our supply chains. Thank you. That's a perfect segue into my next question, which is what information does the government have about the supply chain of the defense industrial base? Does it have good information that shows, is China actually supplying U.S. defense contractors or U.S. companies that are part of that defense industrial base? What do we know? Uh, Secretary Najib Law? Certainly. So what we know is, given the fact that we are in a global market, and therefore our supply chains are global, it is extremely hard to avoid any country being in our supply chain. And so we can absolutely track that China is in our DIB, in our uh, defense industrial base, and they're in our defense supply chain. Now, that doesn't mean that, of course, they're you know, producing very sensitive items at all times, uh, but here's the, re the reality. The sensitivity around critical materials in rare earth is obvious everywhere, right? We're talking about it in chips, we're talking about it with lithium and batteries, we're talking about it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, well, where's the source? And not just the source of the rare earth itself, but who is processing that? Mm -hmm. Where is the manufacturing happening? It's mm -hmm. oftentimes in countries that are not exactly friendly to our national security goals and in China, right? So we know that China is there and we, we in the government use you know, financial filings as well as other uh, vis supply chain visibility and illumination tools and, and business tools to, to gather information on exactly what is flowing into the United States. But we also use government databases and, and filings that are available to the public to track exactly who is in critical areas. Now, what we can only do with that information is pull out trends, which then inform policy on protecting certain uh, supply chains which are called out in the executive order and so we you know we do use open source tools we do have information but of course that information can always be improved upon and so we work with the DIB to really help each other because no one has full visibility right traceability is extremely hard when you're thinking about a component or a part you don't know maybe where that screw came from. And so we have to make the value judgment of do we care? And oftentimes, that is exactly where we're doing a trade-off, a, right, a cost-benefit analysis, so. Thank you. Peter Schwartz, you work for Altana. You co-founded Altana, which exactly looks at the global supply chains. Is there information in the supply chain data and the ownership data that you can be able to trace things back to China or other countries? Yes, absolutely. So just to speak a little bit to sort of what we're doing at Altana, we're building out what we like to think of as sort of the platform for global supply chains, a single source of truth that takes in both proprietary and commercial data sets and fuses them securely and privately to data sets such as those that might exist in a federal context. 
what that then allows is then the bringing of sort of billions of transaction level records, hundreds of millions of corporate registries, information on risk, um, information such as sanctions lists, information, you know, any arbitrary list, perhaps sort of suppliers that you're concerned about, products of interest, and fuse them together in a way that allows the supporting of a mission. And then there's sort of a mutual closing of gaps. I don't want to overpromise, you know, there's always sort of things that can and can't be seen. But by having a system, sort of a federated analytics system, that permits this deployment, you start to narrow at least some of those gaps. Um, to speak a little bit to sort of what this then enables and sort of is, it enables a couple things. One is seen beyond the first tier. Um, you know, my sense is that without additional data sets, it can be very hard from the perspective of sort of an operation in the U.S. to sort of see multiple tiers out, the supplier of the supplier, the supplier of the supplier's supplier, and then train, sort of scope down those value chains for the production of any given part product produced by the defense industrial base and then triage it into its sensitivity and fungibility. Um, by taking this fusion of these data sets together, you then end up with the ability to say, look at, okay, we've got all these different suppliers, for example, involved in the production of an aircraft carrier. However, to, to your point earlier, perhaps we don't care as much about where sort of the screws are coming from. We can analyze that still at scale, but we can narrow down perhaps on signal transmitting types of equipment entering it. Um, where you, what, you will, what we often see is that in the first tier for goods that look like something going into the defense industrial base, um, you know, China will have a relatively small influence, although you'll still see things perhaps for non-signal transmitting equipment or other items, steel coming into it. It's in the second and third tier that you can really see the explosion. It's not to say you don't see something in the first tier. You'll see both ownership plays as well as supplies of equipment that looks problematic from time to time, but it's really monitoring that extended tier that you then start to see this deep interconnection, which is sort of what we'd expect given how globalization has tied everything together over the years. And now we're in this sort of disentangling phase. And so it's not surprising that they're actually, and I think China's industrial base is also deeply entangled with sort of these third parties that sit. And so you've got both direct connections and then sort of you're getting from the same suppliers, which also gives a strange sense of interdependence. Anyways, I'll um, just to speak a little bit to sort of where this goes in the future, and in a bit I'll be talking sort of the solutions that one can apply once you have this information. But, um, you know, so how do you say, how are we gonna close gaps in the future? So certainly fusing together data, doing it in a federated manner, allowing industry to sort of share intelligence without sharing sensitive data, allowing collaboration between friendly nations and companies, that's all something that can be done with modern field of federated learning, federated analytics. But in terms of closing gaps, we also think about sort of the usage of macro data and the imputing of probabilistic networks. So in the future, you know, certainly doing things deterministically is great. I know this company is a risk, but what if it looks like a company that might have Chinese ownership influence? Having that sort of probabilistic vetting is the next stage once you've done with the determinism. But I'll say that there's a lot of, in our view, relatively low hanging fruit still to be done at the second and third tier before one gets into that. Thank you. Let me uh, throw out a question from the audience which fits in with a question I have. Are we not still vulnerable to supply chain disruptions of microelectronics despite the CHIPS Act due to China's belt and road activities globally? I want to add to that my own question, which is um, I worked in China for 12 years as a business reporter, and basically every American company is deeply invested in China, including most, I think, of America's defense contractors. In some of those cases, they have partnerships with the PLA. Um, can the panel address this kind of big question hanging over? How do you um, protect the supply chain when America's best companies are actually part of their supply chain, including the PLA supply chain? Uh, General Corlan, no, I'll start. I'll start. I, I'm sure my, my colleagues here have some really probably some really great thoughts here. The first thing I would tell you is we, we've got to achieve a greater measure of autonomy with our friendlies. And we don't, and we don't you, you've heard us describe those three countries in Southeast Asia that really have the lion's share of this market. If we do that, and we divest ourselves of, their, of this dependency that we have, then I think we create the leverage that we're really trying to seek when we create this capacity uh, onshore, okay? That's the, that is um, the first thing. The second thing is, we have got to educate this ecosystem. And I would tell you, um, 
Yes, there are pockets across the federal government but that understand it, but probably not to the extent that everybody in this country needs to understand this. I think the microelectronics industry shares center stage with the oil industry when it comes to what is the center of gravity, when it comes to the global markets and protecting the national security interests of this country. Okay? And so we have got to educate this ecosystem. The third thing I would say is um, I sometimes uh, look at this definition of best value, right? And how best value right now is technically acceptable, cheapest price. So I'd like to see a greater measure of not just technically acceptable and best price, but sustainability, right? And what is the dependency on the supply chain at times of peace, times of conflict? And I think those need to be brought into the broader definition of um, best value. So those are some thoughts, and I, I'm sure you guys yeah. can flesh Yeah, would, would love to echo that, absolutely, sir. And I think that's one of the things that we've been trying to also do. You're going to have to do business but you need to know who you're doing business with. And it's not a one and done. It's not a, you know, let me just go and acquire it. You have to understand exactly what you're buying from acquire to retire. How does that affect your bottom line? But more importantly, how does that affect the security of those things? And, and one of our former directors uh, said, hey, you know, I'm, it's great that every, we've told everyone to patch. We've told everyone to patch. And then solar winds happens, you know? It's like, wait a minute, we told it, we, you, you told me to patch, I patch, and I'm still not safe. It's, a, it's about that education, it's about understanding exactly who you're, who you're doing business with, but again, that value proposition. Sure, you may save a little bit on the front end, but what's the cost of that breach? What's the cost of your IP being lost and not being able to get to market? Those are the value propositions that we're hoping that we're bringing to the CIOs, bringing to the CIOs, empowering the CISOs who are trying to make those things work all across these industries. And again, making sure that when they're going into that global supply chain, I, you know, there's, there's not really a radio shack on everyone's corner, especially when it, the way I used to grow up. I know I'm dating myself, but still. That's where exactly we have to understand exactly how we bring those value propositions at the front end and understand the risks and the costs through the entire life cycle. Do you want to? Just briefly, absolutely everything my fellow panelists have said. In addition to that, we know that, you know, 52 billion sounds like a lot, but there's more money in the private market when you think about the VC community. And what that, the CHIPS Act and the funding really does is sends a signal on where we can prioritize and hopefully start to bring some investment to hardware and on scale to what we've seen in software, right? I mean, I think we all are aware that software was really got, sought after from the VC community. And now hardware, while you have a longer tail to see some return on investment, it is sustainable investment, right? When you're we're onshoring in manufacturing, the reality is that manufacturing is going to go everywhere, including China. And here's, here's the situation. China is a huge marketplace, and it would be cutting off our nose to spite our face to say, hey, American companies, you can't do business in China. We don't want to be in that posture. Conversely, we are a huge marketplace. And China doesn't want to be in the posture of shutting themselves off from us. So therefore, what the CHIPS Act does is allows for domestic investment to expand that capacity. But you know, you also have the Inflation Reduction Act that has investment in critical materials. You have the infrastructure law that has investment in other critical materials and batteries and the like. And so what we're doing is creating a new incentive structure and changing the standards at play to make sure that everyone has access, right? And everyone has free and open access to those critical materials in the way that the market should flow while still walling off our most precious jewels. I really like that, right? When you think about that, we wall off our most precious jewels because that's how every government operates. Not just us, everyone. So. Yeah. 
And just to add one point there, I think that the promise of sort of understanding the whole ecosystem at scale is then you can surgically understand the progress within specific ecosystems and measure it. So you're like, okay, we need to get these critical components into a healthy ecosystem, not just the first tier, the second tier. But we don't want to sort of, as you well put it, cut off your nose to spite your face. Like, let's, the aggregate statistics might be there's huge, still huge connection. That's fine for many goods. And sort of that's the type of collaboration with the public and private sector and analytics that I think can really help in this matter. Peter, I wonder if you could go a little deeper on that as far as the layers, because I, I myself spend a lot of time looking at the supply chains out of China into China. Where is the breakdown in that data? Where does it become difficult for the US or even, I wonder, American companies, maybe they don't even know their raw materials are coming from China or through yep. Chinese investment overseas? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you know, it can break down in a couple different ways. One would be sourcing domestically from China. You sort of still know you're doing it, but you don't know the domestic internal supply chain. And so you might have exposure to Chinese companies or products that you wish you didn't. I think that's probably the most obvious of the threats, and that's generally what people are already working to mitigate. The second case would be you are sourcing from companies overseas that source from uh, China or Chinese-owned companies, or themselves are owned by Chinese entities, and that's just not something that you know well. It's either hidden or just you don't have the information to handle that at scale. That, for me, would be the more, um, you know, you're only going to capture some of that just to speak to the gaps point. But by unifying more data, you can start to at least publicly available commercial but also proprietary data, you can start to layer on that information and bring new information to the US entities that are sourcing from those companies. So to give an example of like a critical case, you might find that there's signal transmitting equipment going from China to Mexico, and that's something we've seen, and then going into the US defense industrial base. That's very distinct from saying, okay, there's like some sort of copper components that are being used in crucibles that are sent to India and then are you know used in something in Germany and you end up with some steel pipes. Yes, perhaps that's somewhat troubling, but it's not the high, same priority as what I would rate the first one that's fungible interdependence. So as I think about those gaps and also sort of where they exist, those are some of the strategies like they just sort of mitigate them and then sort of understand priority within them. Right. Yeah. So that you, you kind of think about the yeah. supply chain of resources and real tangible goods. I wonder about the supply chain of software, and I know that's come up with, with everyone on the panel, is how are we tracking the software supply chain, is there any place that, that has a list of like who is using what software? How do you, how do you deal with that? <laughs> uh, <go ahead. laughs> yeah, the software supply chain is definitely one of the things that we've been um, focusing on. I mean, you can look at where software is just um, been ubiquitous everywhere. Uh, we, I was just uh, reading articles today about medical devices. Um, a lot of the medical devices and the software that is there is 10, 20 years old at some, in some places, and the vulnerabilities have not yet been patched or fixed. How do we make sure that the software needs to get upgraded, but at the same time is upgraded with the, with the actual uh, security um, breaches? So one of those things that I think we've tried to do, especially with regards to the government, is, is um, inserting software cybersecurity uh, requirements for critical software. Um, and Executive Order 14028 for cybersecurity initiatives, making sure that those things that are going into those critical mission systems, those critical um, uh, things within the government that we've been able to identify, if it's going to be a software node, it's got to meet those critical software standards. So, so that, that's a start. It is not the finish um, because clearly we understand that even some proprietary software has a lot of open source software components. And, and I, I don't, we will not get into the open source uh, software versus proprietary software debate, but to the extent that you know that everyone is reliant upon software, whether it's government, whether it's industry, whether it's other industries, I believe that's where we can come together and impress upon um, the software industry community. We want to be safer, securer, and, and better. What can we do to make sure that you understand those requirements in terms of our mission needs or even our proprietary needs? How are we going to be able to make sure that this particular industry gets that we, we need this um, to be able, to, be able to, to scale and also to be more secure? The, the ship and fix motto has got to be changed. Uh, Peter, a question for you. How can AI tools identify supply chain risks and help companies mitigate them? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. So to sort of build upon what I was talking about earlier, there are all these disparate data sets that exist both within government that exist in commercial data sets, that exist in proprietary data sets in different partners around the world. Um, you want to fuse these together, but you face a few challenges. One is the lack of unique identifiers. Um, so they'll say, I don't say Walmart, Waldash, Mart, Walmart in Chinese, Walmart in Russian. Uh, you'll have this it's problem at scale. That's a field called entity resolution. That's something that AI can help with. That's natural language processing and machine learning to fuse that together and start to put together a picture of where are all the companies located, where are the facilities, where are the goods moving from and to, and then also I would say where are the gaps, to go back to your earlier point. So comparison to sort of the macro level statistics, you say we don't have information here, we can at least understand what we don't know. Um, once you've got that though, um, you're gonna wanna really sort of start to take action upon it. So insight generation, I think, I mean, the other panelists spoke really well to it, you gotta have triage, you gotta go through and say what is important and what isn't. And um, through these systems, you get a couple benefits. One is through, and I'll speak to this point, I think that you're not gonna put all this data together into one big bucket. That's insecure, that's not safe, and it's often not permitted among collaborating partners. What you want instead is what they call federated analytics or federated machine learning, the ability to have the systems transmit only permitted analytics between them and still highlight risks, either descriptively or train models, just different ways to summarize it that's compliant. So you can say, there is a problem here, but I don't have to give you all the backing data as to why there is, because I'm not permitted or it's not secure. This can work high side, low side. This can also just work uh, just between different parties that have different restrictions on moving data. Um, once you've got that, then you can start to take a look at things like extended network screening, where you say, you know, you know it's, in any cases, you're gonna have something you need to go investigate, right? It's not gonna be AI being like, hey, like, I solved the problem for you. Like, mm -hmm. it's gonna be like, um, you're gonna go and you're gonna say, okay, now I've got the defense industrial base at scale. I know where my gaps are and know where they're not. Now I'm gonna say, let's have a method, again, automated to get a triage list of what I think I need to investigate. So these types of products, and you're often gonna have it at a very discrete level, you know, text descriptions of goods, different fairly granular product codes. Let's go through and let's sort them, and let's sort them also by their importance, whether that's fungibility, exposure to certain geographies, certain types of products you're particularly sensitive, some combination thereof and then bubble up to the top the relationships, links, and ecosystems that you're gonna to wanna to check and potentially remediate. Um, you can also have probabilistic recommendations, and you know, for example, this looks like the signature of companies that are exposed to China in addition to deterministic ones, uh, so you can sort it by both. You can also then run scenario-based risks. So, I mean, this scenario here we're talking about is pretty obvious, you know, you're worried about sort of Taiwan, for example. You're like, what is this impact? That may be, frankly, a fairly obvious answer, a lot of stuff, but uh, you can both tactically then go and find what's most impacted, and you can also take a look at maybe more nuanced questions like with the war in Ukraine, what's being impacted here? Things that, it, you know, it's not as obvious what is impacted there because it's not just semiconductors and bold print. Um, and then finally, the final step of AI assistance here is recommendation systems to at least recommend companies to replace and remediate the ecosystem. So you might say to yourself, here is, you know, it's a, it's a broad world, and I think for those of you who are involved in supply chain or procurement, you know how hard vendor selection and identification can be, especially for nuanced goods, goods that are either very specific or um, have relatively discrete suppliers. Now, AI is not gonna produce supplies out of nothing, but what it can do is identify, maybe there's a nearshoring opportunity, maybe there's a friendshoring opportunity, maybe there's types of goods that are related where this facility could be repurposed, and make, again, that short list. So just to sort of put a bow on it, I'd say, yeah, I can support in this manner and give a decision support flow. It's never, you know, it can, it can help to identify its gaps and give uncertainty, but it's always gonna be collaboration with sort of the experts and um, the people who really know it to really solve this problem. It's too complicated for, it's not gonna be a machine, like, right, just right, typing right, it up. Right, Yeah. Secretary Najib Locke, um, do you have any remarks regarding the new executive order this morning on CFIUS? Um, this seems to be a big issue, is not just the supply chains of the U.S. understanding what's out there in China, Taiwan, and around the world, but what is happening in the U.S., Chinese investment into the U.S., or not just Chinese, but other countries. Absolutely. Um, it's extremely timely. I think there's, frankly, a identification in the executive branch in our uh, conversations that perhaps the industrial base, not just the DIB, but the industrial base from a larger perspective 
doesn't exactly understand what they're signing up to when they're accepting certain investment, right? And so oftentimes what we've seen and what the executive order is really getting after is the policy discussion of how do we, using CFIUS as a tool when we see it, how do we then become more proactive? How do we help companies understand, okay, in this case is before us, we're, we're trying to mitigate for, for these reasons, and the underlying is if you accept this investment and yes, okay, you sign the dotted line, you're walled off, say for instance, a Chinese state-owned enterprise, if they invest in you, you might very well be putting yourself at risk for future investment because there may be companies, because of the changing global dynamic, it's not just CFIUS, but we see our allies are doing foreign investment screening. So there may be an investor from an allied company that now no longer wants to invest in you because you have a tie to the CCP. Or if you accept that investment, often what we see through CFIUS is an increase of value. Say they'll, you know, they have unlimited money that we'll see if it's actually backed or not, if it stays that way. But they'll artificially raise the price that they invest in you, and then it drops, and so you're really at risk of a third-party investor that you then didn't want to be in business with, and now they have multiple board seats, and you've lost control of your company. And so I think the, the regime right now is trying to think through how do we educate and bring along the market that is very expansive when you think about technologies. And, you know, OSTP put out the uh, critical technologies list. How are we going to protect in those areas and companies that are in those areas while still really wanting to see that innovation flourish. We don't want to stymie innovation, but we do want to be cognizant that you are being targeted for a reason. How do we talk about Belt and Road Initiative? How do we talk about, if you accept this, this is what you're accepting? And often, how do we talk to our domestic investors to say, hey, I understand that you know we have a lot of outbound investment in other companies. Perhaps you want to turn that inward, right? How do we signal send? And I think that's been discussed in some of the uh, uh, CHIPS funding as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. And so that conversation is happening. And I think the EO uh, strengthening the foreign investment screening regime contemplates all of this because the president has been clear that he's concerned with exactly how China is manipulating and or influencing certain supply chains. Right. So we have 10 minutes left and uh, we're talking about solutions. I want to turn to General Horlander uh, and ask, you're at, you were in the U.S. Army 39 years, you're now at Intel, you're working on these national security and defense issues. What is Intel doing? So, so the first thing I'd tell you, I, I kind of I answer this in two different ways, right? Um, this, this industry is ready-made to protect itself, right? All the actors are very much wanting to protect their intellectual property. So when I, when I joined Intel, I started to learn about the company. What I learned right, very quickly right away is the, this company is organized and operated to safeguard the supply chain, okay? It's very selective in who it chooses as its suppliers. When it writes a contract, it's very specific for what that supplier will and won't do. There are audits conducted on these suppliers. So internal to, to Intel is, is this, this, very, this very robust effort because we, we, we very much understand how, the, how important it is to be able to protect that supply chain from cradle to grave. Uh, the, the second thing I would say about that is Intel has really taken on an, an industry leadership role. It's, it's always, we, we grew up with Intel, right? Very iconic company, and uh, it was there in the beginning uh, in Silicon Valley, et cetera. But it's really taken on an industry leadership role. Uh, and when you think about what has just happened here over the, let, I'll call it the last two years with the CHIPS Act, there was a, a an immense effort from the leadership across Intel to educate the ecosystem, 
to work with the administration, to work with Congress, um, to work with the defense industrial base. And so they've really taken a, an industry role to, um, to help build the, the future that we endeavor to have, and that would be to rebalance this, this global foot, footprint that we have that right now is, is kind of out of balance and we're all very much concerned about it. So I, I would just tell you, if, as I see it, those are some of the, the, the things that, that Intel is doing. You know, Intel is very careful, you guys, about what it does where, okay? So a lot of the high-end compute kind of stuff is very much here in the United States of America and not done offshore. So the, those, those are the kinds of things. Intel is very much a, a premier national security partner for this country, okay? And, and recognizes its role to, to be that. So um, I, I, re I really think, um, you know, it, in, Intel has really uh, helped and helped the country in, in, this, in, this, in this realm. Uh, we have five, four minutes left, so I want to just wrap up with some final thoughts on solutions from each member of the panel. I'll start, sorry, with Peter <laughs> to give you the first shot at what, what are the solutions uh, uh, or what solutions haven't we talked about, maybe? Yeah, let me, um, maybe I'll speak a little bit more to sort of the monitoring of, so I've talked about some of the solutions that I see as being sort of viable here. Just to talk a little more sort of the future and how you understand how you deal with gaps in analyses and how that fits into it. Um, so as you think about sort of the problems you're going to face, you're going to have this data and you're always going to have something that's missing. You know what I mean? The commercial data sets, the proprietary data sets, um, adversary action that's concealed to take control of companies, to infiltrate them, insider threat, what have you. So sort of the vision that we have and that sort of we've been thinking a lot about, and I know that folks in the IC and in many communities think about as well, is about sort of understanding probabilistically the nature of the world and making an estimate of what's happening at scale. So to unify the micro, which is what I've been talking about here, these micro transactions, this information, with sort of a macro understanding of the flows between these two countries are this much, or this oil showed up and we don't know where it came from. Well, there's probably a couple hypotheses, right? So the, the sort of the, the point being that the obvious sort of sort of having obvious priors at scale produces non-obvious outcomes. It's sort of Oakham's electric razor, if you think about it that way. That, I think, is part of the solution in the longer term. And that's how you deal with data sets that come on and off with different types of information and then unify it to everything I talked about earlier around sort of both descriptive statistics, recommendation systems, and very actionable portfolio triage. Mm -hmm. Thank Secretary you. Najibla. Yeah. Yes, I think the solution that um, we're doing in the Defense Department is indicative of using our large budget to signal SIN and create some consistency as far as how we're using advanced procurement, multi-year procurements, and investing using the Defense Production Act or the Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainment uh, Fund to build domestic capacity. So that is a solution set and it's tied to our analysis, which we really highlight in our EEO report on America's supply chain. And so we're, we're really prioritizing and the hope is that as we want to prioritize our funding roadmaps to the areas of vulnerability that we've highlighted, we will close that gap and reduce the choke points and reduce dependency on those foreign adversaries. And then we will be able to shift attention to other areas because we must prioritize. And if we're focused on the same thing over and over, that means we're not really getting after it. And so working with the market to signal sin so that when we're able to do perhaps you know, recapitalization and help a small business that needs and forging to buy a new line or ex extend their line, extend their forge and the like, that we're able to then help build that redundancy in production line that's necessary and that's been highlighted in both COVID and the response to the invasion of Ukraine. Thank you. Director McMillan. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, no, I, certainly echoing everything the panelists have said, but one of the things that I think that we can really emphasize, taking a page from the, for, the FIRMA and the CFIUS page was to create a council for federal acquisition and for federal acquisition security. In fact, the Secure Technology Act established the Federal Acquisition Security Council, which was looking at the ICTS, the cyber supply chain, and all of the folks that are purchasing and going back and forth between those specific supply chains across the federal enterprise. 
We also raised the bar on supply chain risk management programs, making sure that they were absolutely required for federal programming. And again, that gives a signal into the industry that, okay, if we are going to try to get into the federal supply chain for ICTS, how do we have to raise the bar on our security? So that's one of those things that we are signaling and channeling through, because sometimes you can't catch that at the investment phase, but it's one of those additional levers of influence that I believe that this particular uh, council will have in the future. Thank you. General Horlander, last Just words. Just uh, obviously echo all, all my, my colleagues here. The, the only final thought that I'd share with everybody is microelectronics is, is here to stay, okay? <laughs> it's not going anywhere. And it is more and more and more a part of our lives. So let's not forget about the professional development and the talent management of the future workforce and the leaders in this industry, okay? We have got to have a healthy investment in that for the future. Thank you. Please thank our panel for joining us. Thank you.